uh, namaskarams to everyone. Uh, good morning to the folks here in sunny Michigan, and good evening to the folks joining us from Chennai. Uh, I'm Sri Lankapati from the Great Lakes Aradhana Committee here in Michigan. Our special guest today is uh, Dr. Palga Ramprasad. Uh, we also have uh, Sri Roger Natarajan, Sri Vinod Sitaraman, Sri Jay Shankar Balan, and Sri Shankar Krishnan joining us today as panelists. And we welcome you all to today's session where we have a unique lecture demonstration on the Mridanga Chakravarti, the king of Mridangam, Palgad Sri Maniyayar, on his 108th birth anniversary. So before we start, I uh, just wanted to mention a few words on the Great Lakes of Karna Committee. Uh, GLAC, as we call it, is the oldest and largest classical musical music organization based in Detroit, Michigan. 2020 is the 35th year of GLAC, and we had a great season schedule. But as one great man once said, the only thing constant in life is change. So GLAC was one of the first organizations to proactively cancel our uh, concert season and quickly adapt our season to an online series. Uh, we also partnered with Mudra in Chennai and brought out almost two years of concerts uh, back in the month of April uh, for our uh, Rasikas with a series called Nimadi uh, during a quarantine lockdown. So we had like two weeks of, you know, almost uh, 20 concerts uh, throughout the course of April. Uh, what more, we sw quickly switched our uh, music festivals like the Annamacharya Festival, which was done online, uh, through S Cube TV and uh, also did a virtual Tyagaraja Aradhana festival. Uh, we are continuing with, we had a leg dem on Konakol by Somashekar Joy. Uh, most recently, we had a Harikatha with uh, Sri Embar Kasturi. Uh, today's session on Sri Mani Iyer, uh, just a quick introduction, was the first Mridangam Vidwan to win the Sangeeta Kalanidhi and Padma Bhushan Awards by the government of India. He received the Sangeet Natak Academy Award and along with his contemporaries, Pioneer Subramaniam Pillai and uh, Sri Murga Bhubati, they were referred to as the Holy Trinity in Mridangam. Today we have his illustrious grandson and it's my personal pleasure and honor to have him with us and a long time dream to have this under the GLAC banner. Uh, they say humility is like the mother of all virtues and uh, Sri Ram Prasad didn't want an introduction, but I chose to just introduce him with a few words because I was looking at his background and it was pretty impressive. Uh, as you all know, he's the grandson of the legendary Mridangas Palgat Maniyir. Uh, Sri Ram Prasad started learning music from a very young age under his father, Sri P. R. Rajaram. Hailed as a child prodigy, even as a teenager, he accompanied several leading with ones like Sangeet Kalanidhi, Sri P.K. Murthy, Sri Palgat Raghu, Sri TVG, Umayal Shivaraman, Umayal Param Shivaraman, uh, Sri Trichy Shankaran, and many others. Ram Prasad aims at adhering his traditional classical style with emphasis on Nerval, which according to his grandfather is a test of a true vocalist. In this regard, Ram Prasad had the rarest of blessings to get first-hand information through his uncle T.R. Rajamani about Sri Maniyayar's view on how to handle improvisations on stage with various ragas and tempos. What's more impressive is his traditional uh, Aryakudi Ramana Jayangar and K.V. Narayana Swami genre of music, which entails arduous training and sustained practice uh, compared to other styles. Uh, Ram Prasad has a PhD in economics and was a visiting professor at Harvard, Harvard University and received several, like seven or eight gold medals and holds the record for the highest mark scores scored. He was also placed among the 50 most influential powers in India by Open Magazine. So on behalf of GLAC, let's give a warm welcome uh, to our worldwide audience. Namaskarams. Thanks for having me in this. Uh, so before we start, a few words on the format. So uh, I'm gonna place everyone on mute, uh, except the panelists who can unmute them, themselves before asking the question. 
we are not going to have an open Q and A session, so it's just going to be our panelists who who are going to be asking these questions. Uh, but for the folks on the call, if you have any questions, please put them in chat. I'll be monitoring the chat actively, and we'll be asking them on a first come first serve basis. Uh, this is going to be an interactive session, just like a panel discussion, trying it for the first time with folks asking questions. Uh, these questions, like I was mentioning earlier, but before people were joining, we're trying to not make it like a rapid fire question session, but more of an informal chat with humor, personal anecdotes, et cetera, just trying to keep it interesting for our audience. Uh, so let me start by introducing myself. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Sriram Ganapati from GLAC. And uh, I'd also want the panelists to spend a few minutes introducing themselves as well before we proceed to ask the first question. And we'll take the questions uh, in this order. So I'll be asking the first question, uh, Sri Roger Natarajan, Vinod Sitaram, and Jay Shankar Balan and Shankar Krishna. So with that, I'd like to uh, go around uh, the table and ask the panelists to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Roger Natarajan, and I am one of the volunteers of the Cleveland Tyagaraja Aradhana since 1985. Hello, Namaskaram. I'm uh, Vinod Sitaraman. I live in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, I'm a Mridhanam artist. Uh, good morning. And namaskarams to everybody. My name is Jai Shankar Balant. I'm also a resident of the metropolitan, metropolitan Detroit area. And uh, I'm a violinist. Um, and uh, I have shared the stage with Ram Prasad multiple times and look forward to doing that multiple times. And needless to say, uh, I'm, I'm a big, 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 big fan of his granddad. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Shankar uh, Krishnan, based out of uh, Detroit. As Sira mentioned, I was uh, president of uh, GLAC. And uh, looking at what uh, Sriram has been uh, doing, specifically during this uh, you know, new novel, I, I think um, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a great, uh, great leadership by Sriram. And I'm always, uh, I don't know whether I've done anything great as uh, running the organization, but one thing I'm absolutely proud of is uh, finding the right uh, leadership. So coming back to today's session, I'm extremely, extremely looking forward to uh, to interact uh, with, uh, with you, Ram Prasad. Uh, we all know uh, the legendary uh, CMI, as we always uh, refer him as, Palgar Bania here. And I'm really looking forward to hear uh, uh, about him during the session. Okay. Thanks everyone. Uh, so I also wanted to mention this uh, session is being recorded. So for the folks who missed it, we are going to be uploading in uh, YouTube and social media and, uh, for the folks who missed. So, uh, so I can start with the first question. So uh, Ram Prasad, tell us a little bit something about yourself. Uh, how was it growing up in a family of musicians? Um, under illustrious uh, Palagat Mani year. Uh, you also uh, did a PhD, worked at Harvard, um, corporate life and how you took into music full time. Uh, did you learn Mridangam? Uh, when and how did you switch to vocal? I know it's a good question, but um, <laughs> all of these. Sure. Uh, so this this seems much like a question uh, on an interview panel where they say, "Tell me about yourself." So just give me a timeline. <laughs> give me a timeline. <laughs> so I I wrap this up in like about a couple of minutes. All right. Yeah. So born in this family, uh, everything that I present in front of you with respect to music, I owe every bit to my guru, who is my father, Sri Raja Ram, and. Uh, Growing up with music, I mean, I am reminiscent of all the tit adi vada that I got from my father. So that's predominantly my childhood. And that is predominantly everything that is related to music that I can think of as uh, growing up with music. But the thing is, uh, 
as how parents you know grow their children with uh, you know stories from ramayana mahabharata or whatever their faith system is my father grew me up with anecdotes from the past and the life of money here so even though i have not interacted with uh, my tata directly uh, the kind of impression that i have of mani tata is like so real and uh, that's that's completely owing to my father's upbringing and the way he grew me up and the way he taught me about how mani tata not only on stage was creating magic but also off stage how he used to deal with other artists his rapport with uh, his co musicians um, and all that so that has been pretty much uh, uh, the environment in which i grew up and uh, after completing my uh, you know uh, masters here in economics i also did my post graduation business administration i worked for a year here and then came for a phd uh, in 2004 5 at the university of georgia and the one thing which was keeping me alive in music besides my 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 probably 45 minute or one hour practice session every day was a teaching so i had quite a bit of students to teach so that kept me going throughout my even during my thesis time so that was keeping me alive uh, then uh, i worked for a few years there in academia as well as uh, corporate sector and then uh, 2012 when my daughter was born is when i decided that i got to decide where i'm going to be so i made a final plunge and came here and uh, yeah i worked for a few universities here in india and also few corporate sectors and just a small correction while you while you while you did the introduction i didn't um, i didn't teach at harvard because i was a postdoc at harvard so whatever that entailed in terms of teaching probably yes but i was not a faculty at harvard i just want to make it very clear that is one thing and then really uh, impressive <laughs> right so a couple of years back uh, i just made this decision of sticking to one thing and doing something properly because it became all, almost convenient for me so if i had a bad concert i could also always post it on my workload and if i had a bad day at work i could always say that you know what i have music to do so at some point in time i had to take some ownership of what i was doing so about a couple of years back in 2018 march april is when i decided that i am going to switch uh, full time to music and two years it's been really good i'm enjoying my time because this is this is what i wanted i wanted to spend my time in music and i'm getting it so what more it's such a blessing that's i wrapped it up in a couple of minutes good <laughs> <laughs> so quick follow up to that before um, we move on to the next question ray do you think that's uh, it was a tough decision to make and you know uh, all your education years you spent on education do you think you know uh, you can put to use somewhere uh, versus you know taking a break from uh, all the corporate life and you know switching to music where you have to uh, look at you know a totally different aspect from things and also looking at uh, the steady income which comes from a corporate culture versus you know being used yes yeah, so it's a very valid point i mean in general i am not very decisive so <laughs> that adds to adds to the issues here yeah you are right uh, it's not a very easy decision but i mean even if i have to look at it very rationally all this education uh, all my academic background has been pretty recent compared to my music i have been growing up with music since my childhood i don't even know when i started singing first it's been that early but if i had to pinpoint and say that when i actually plunged into academics probably i'll be able to put a timeline and say that this is exactly the year in which i started so in that regard probably rationality would prevail and say that you know what you have been doing something for more number of years so why not actually continue with that so that is one simple way of looking at it as far as income is concerned yeah um, uh, but i mean my advantage was probably i started singing at a very young age so to establish to reestablish was not as much as an issue as like a newcomer so that definitely had a lot of benefits with respect to making my decision that eased it out a bit uh, so that's what it is thank you is it my turn yes oh okay just wanted to make sure um you know the relationship between a grandfather and a grand 
child is always very special. I know that because I have six grandchildren of my own. So um, what was your earliest memory of your grandfather? Uh, why don't we finish that and then I'll come back with a follow-up question. Right. So unfortunately, I was way too young uh, when my grandfather passed away. But the one blessing there, uh, as far as the interaction is concerned, is uh, while my grandfather was in his deathbed and he lost his consciousness, he could recollect incidents only from his profession. Like the names that he uttered even after he was unconscious was Raman Jengar, Dakshinamurthy Pullai, Rajamanikam Pullai, uh, and Mali, I mean, all of the brothers. So the only family member that he mentioned was, he referred to me as Pudu Korande because I was a newborn of the family. So that I consider as a blessing. He, that is the only recalling that he had of any of his family members for that matter. So he said that Pudu Korande ke paata katata, Pudu Korande ke murdangam katata. So that was the only familial thing that he was able to recall in, even at, the, at that stage. So, now that when I had grown up, he would have been thrilled to have a conversation with me. <laughs> not, not, definitely not. But uh, that is something which I consider it as a major blessing. I mean, whatever I do in music, I entirely owe it to Appa. Uh, but these are the brownie points which I should consider as a blessing that I have to whatever I do in music. So that's the interaction probably that I'm proud to say that, yeah, the, uh, other, other than that, I don't have any any recalling of any memory. Uh, also, uh, within the family, I'm sure you have heard uh, lots of stories about your Tata through your parents and Attais and others in the family. Um, you mentioned uh, Dakshina Murthy Pillai. So I wonder what stories have been passed on to you about your Tata's views on uh, Sri Dakshinamurti Pillai, and then his own guru, Vaidhinath Ayer, and then last but not the least, uh, Chambai Vaidhinath Bhagavata. These three artists, what are the stories that have been passed on to you? Yeah, as you rightly said, uh, though I may not have interacted with him, I mean, all the stories that I know of, even in my childhood, was based on Manitada's interaction and what are his views were about music. So, Appa, Peripa, everybody used to tell that. As well as the fact that Appa and Peripa used to record the conversations that Manitata used to have home. So I have listened to those tapes. Uh, I mean, those, those are like really interesting conversations. Uh, of course, there are several incidents. Like, I mean, I myself can think of about 60 to 70 incidents of uh, what Manitata had about Dakshinamurti Pillai. So I'll just touch upon like one or two, uh, because these are the incidents which he used to constantly, you know, repeat. So the first thing about Dakshinamurti Pillai and Tanjore Vadina Dayar, uh, he used to say that all his prodigal capabilities that he imbibed was predominantly from these two. So to the effect that about 80 to 90 percent of his genius was attributed to what he learned from Tanjavur Vadina Dayar and what he learned on stage from Dakshinamurti Pillai. So the one thing that constantly Manitata used to say whenever people talk about Dakshinamurti Pillai and say that he was, Manitata was the one who, who actually, you know, tamed down Dakshinamurti Pillai, Manitata used to refuse it blindly. He used to say that there was no one on earth who could ever come close to Dakshinamurti Pillai. So he used to say that the advantage that he had was physically, age-wise, experience-wise, everything, Dakshinamurti Pillai was like much bigger than Manitata. So even on stage, when as a teenager or even as a 12, 13 year old, when Manitata used to sit on stage, he was a gigantic personality, Dakshinamurti Pillai. So uh, Manitata used to say that whatever little I did, I had the support of the audience because they were like, they were expecting somebody to actually tame him. And he was someone who had the promise of coming close. So he always used to say that that is something which worked to my advantage. I personally, that is one advantage that I had. The other advantage that I had is he used to say that Dakshinamurti Pillai typically plays mind games. Okay. So, <laughs> Uh, he used to say that the mind games that he used to play with other Murdangas probably did not work with Manitata. He used to say that's again because of the audience, uh, you know, support that he had. So he used to say, "Was small, 
the kadasi ta that he used to play he used to deliberately get into the ears of the murdangas so that they are like they are like totally off guard on what is happening right and he used to say that the the sound of the ganjira used to be like so strong that it used to take some time to even recover from what you heard okay especially sitting right next to him and whenever he plays he used to make all these um, uh, gestures like dadi ketta tum dadi ketta tum dadi ketta tum tha sami am something like this so you're like you're not even like off <laughs> off guard with this but also the kind of language that he uses on stage i mean he used to intimidate the guest so he used to say that that is something which which did not work with me whatever kind of intimidation i used to think like unless otherwise he is going to literally throw me off of stage i am not going to care about what's happening here so that is something which he used to say i mean so many on stage things that he learned from dakshana murthy pillai he used to say that how to beautify extremely simple things so something like three fives that ticket atum that ticket atum that ticket atum that is like a simple thing which any murdangas any vocalist anyone would know but he would say that the appropriate place in which he used to place these three fives that would make a big difference so though these are like three fives the place in which you put the timing and the kirtane in which you put and the placement of it that would make a huge difference so he used to say that the way he handled simple things was something which was tremendous so that is uh, i mean the way he looked at dakshinamurthy pillai was like he was a god to him and he used to reiterate that nobody can come close to him and he also used to clarify that he has never sat in the murdangas position as some uh, news comes out fa- factually incorrect he has never given his place dakshinamurthy pillai always used to sit in the murdangas place the only advantage manitata had was he used to sit side by side with the vocalist he had never sat in front of dakshinamurthy pillai ever so that is again a clarification he used to constantly make that is one thing there are there are several stories i mean due to want of time i will move to uh, tanjavur vaidinadayar so uh, the relationship that he had with tanjavur vaidinadayar uh, was actually more than a guru and a sishya it was more like a father and a son in fact every time he used to prepare something and uh, when tata used to come uh, via tanjavur and uh, he used to halt at uh, vaidinadayar's house he used to stay there he used to say maniya idana prepare panirkanda ida paarra ida neen danda vaasikano nee dakshana murthi pulla and pulle kitta nee vaasikano da enak vaasikam mudiyadu neen dhan vaasikano so he used to be like so open in saying that i cannot do that but you are the one who is fit to do that therefore i have prepared something which will suit you the most so that is the kind of uh, uh, vision that he had for money ayer and how he would handle pulle work so the entire gamut here was playing around with everything that would actually corner pillai wall so that was always a constant until pillai wall's death because he was he was such a figure uh, that you had to come up with something like it, it 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 was like i mean until the 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 game is over you never know that nadal has lost right it's it's something like that i mean he just pounds on and on and on and on and on so he used to say that and one incident which he used to say uh, uh, is that uh, for i think this was a concert in tanjavur i don't remember that properly whether it was in tanjavur or palakkad but uh, manitata and uh, vaidinadayar were together and for some reason uh, vaidinadayar's shirt for the concert was not ready so he took manitata's shirt and said avon chatte potukuren onna mari konna vaasikala try pandrenda okay na so just to translate that i am wearing your shirt i just hope that i play like you uh, so that's the kind of that's the kind of magnanimity with uh, magnanimity with which they operated that is one thing and chembai ward uh, again uh, he was responsible for bringing manitata on stage when there are several incidents so he used to say that the two voices which are natural and uh, even if a person who has no clue of what carnatic music is if he were to sing he would either fall under the two categories of either chembai ward or ramana jayangar so this is his view of how the vocal production of chembai vidyanath bagadar was um, so this is about them did i miss any any other follow up question from you or no no you got it thank you okay. all right uh <laughs> I'll probably go next. Uh, I hope you can hear me. 
uh, first of all, I'm thrilled to be listening to all these anecdotes and incidents and experience uh, of a fa- I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about <laughs> it, uh, about a favorite artist uh, and some god for Mridangam, especially for an artist like me, uh, who spent all their life listening to Mani or Mani or Val. Uh, just a couple of, I'll share uh, experience. I've never met Mani Ayer, uh, sir, in person at all. But uh, obviously, listening to his concerts from growing up, I didn't have many access to many concerts like we have today, where we have, you know, terabytes of data, right? We've only had few cassettes. So the few cassettes that I had, uh, would had most of the old concerts had Mani Ayer, sir, as the Mridangam accompaniment, which was a great boon. Uh, so, DK Patamal, uh, DK J sir was one kachiri I had, which money is uh, the famous Nindi uh, Ninayanbe uh, to the Jagan Mohini Pallavi. So, I would listen to those kachiris, um, uh, Alatur kachiri with Lalgudi sir and Madhur Mani Ayer kachiri with Lalgudi sir. It was almost this limited collection. The advantage was you would listen to it in a loop again and again and again and again. So as a child, I didn't understand technically much was what was going on. But what always struck me was the sound of the Mridanga. Even in the tape where that, that time they didn't have the digital uh, <coughs> microphones like we have, the sound of the Mridanga was something that really, really, as a child, something that you took notice. And uh, when I grew a little more as a, a student of Mridanga, when I would try to play some of the Sollukattu, it was almost impossible to comprehend on a on a audio tape what he was playing so it was uh, so that had the uh, you know difficulty and then later when i understood a little more uh, you learned to appreciate why he used a certain topi or a ta instead of a key or why you understood the reasons so i'm trying to say the same artist a piece to a child who didn't know anything uh, the same artist uh, uh, challenge the student who was trying to learn and the same artist we could appreciate when we learned a little more. So just amazing, amazing, amazing artist. Uh, also, uh, Ram Prasad, I was following your blog uh, on Facebook, uh, you know, the first 15 days uh, of uh, the lockdown, <laughs> you were writing uh, 15 days of uh, blogs of incidents of Manier. I really, really enjoyed it. I wish you would continue it. Uh, I, every day I would look, I would finish that and I would reread it and then I would wait for the next day, basically. <laughs> so, just amazing, amazing. And especially somebody who has insight to the, you know, the real stories. Uh, sorry, it took some time, but I wanted to share that before I asked you a question. My main question is uh, related to his practice, because uh, as a Mridangam artist, I know Mani Erwal became very famous from a very young age. He was accompanying all the great artists. So even though he came to prominence and he was the, the main, uh, you know, sort of artist, only somebody who was in the house, maybe like your father or your peripas, would know what Manir did as a regular practice. Did he have a regimen for practice? Did he compose during practice? Or was his practice only during teaching? I'm just very curious about his practice regimen, uh, what, what is his regular day-to-day practice. Sure, sure. And thanks for your kind words about the incidents that I that I wrote on Facebook. Yeah, so uh, I'll just break this into three pieces. Like, uh, as I mean, he used to say how he used to practice as a child and until he grew up. So let me start off with that. Uh, during one of the famous interviews, that is a Lyme interview, somebody has asked him, like, have you practiced or is it all genius? I mean, it's, it's just God sent. He like uh, very earnestly replied, no, I used to practice a lot. <laughs> like it's, it's someone like Federer saying, no, I mean, it looks easy, but I do, I do my job. So the same way he used to say that yes, he has practiced a lot. And the one thing which, you, which, which, which he relished in his childhood, in his practice regimen was, he used to say he used to practice at least like six or seven hours. So uh, one of the practice sessions was in the morning where he and uh, Bilba Driyayur, Gatam Bilba Driyayur, they both used to take bath in the river and get to the rocks of the temple. And uh, the timing was straightforward. Until their towels were dry, they had to practice. 
So this is the practice session he used to say that he enjoyed the most. It, it, it used to be back and forth between Vilvadri Iyer and Mani Iyer. So I mean, we know that it takes like about a couple of hours for you know towels to dry, especially in the early morning. So he used to say that two and a half, three hours is something which, which he used to relish in the practice session. More generally, uh, as much as he used to emphasize on physical actual practice. He used to say that it is as important to keep thinking. He used to say the kutinde rakanam. Kutinde rakanam is like basically like just keeping on hitting it, trying to think, think over, think over, think over, think over, think over until he used to say the apni uranam. And he used to say that you, you, you should not be able to sleep over something. It should bother you so much because you should have thought about it so much. It could be one simple sol or it would be one faran or it just be one, one it could be anything. It could be one sa, it could be one re, it could be anything. And as much as you keep thinking about it, he used to say it also depends on how you define practice. To him, practice was not like the way they show in movies, like just take a tambura, just go near the, the puja room and just start singing and enjoy yourself. He used to say even if you practice for five minutes under like like 20 degree uh, you know, uh, temperature, you should still sweat. So that is a practice. So you should be attempting for the ones which you never ever get. And you should keep on trying on that. So if you are comfortable in a practice session, if you come like happily without a sweat in your practice session, he says that it's not practice. Members and for that matter anyone who attends concert because those days information wasn't available as, as it is today from social media or whatever. So it's like physical presence that would convey the information about a concert. So while he was, uh, he was 67, 68, my Ate had gone to a concert and she came back and uh, so as usual he got a complete feedback of what the concert was, who, who played the violin, how it was. He, then he, he went to the Murdangam and he asked like who played the Murdangam, she said someone. Uh, and then she said that uh, he played Farans so much that the audience were thrilled and there was so much of applause even during his Mora. So he carefully listened, oh really, okay, so what else? And he just went deeper. He said that, okay, what kind of forens did he play? Uh, then, so finally he understood that it was the speed of the Murdangam that actually carried the show. So imagine he was like 67, 68. So what he did was, for the next two days, he was practicing forens. And then he called upon my Atai and he said, just sit here. And he prayed forens for a few minutes and said, so did he play the way that I am playing or was it better? <laughs> so even at that age, when, I mean, he had no stakes there, absolutely. Like, uh, he has achieved everything. I mean, possibly what a human could. But still, the penchant for bettering his own is something which he considered as practice. So it, it could be an external motivation, it could be an internal motivation. The inspiration was always to better yourself. And even at that age, if he could do that, it, I mean, even telling this, I get goosebumps. So it's it's so inspiring. It's so inspiring that a person of that stature who had nothing to prove, I have to reiterate this like a million times, like what didn't he achieve when he was 67? He was, he was dead in the next two years. He had absolutely nothing to prove, but still he believed in that. He believed that we have to work towards getting something. And he also did not believe in the natural gifts and all that stuff. He used to say that it will take you only so much, but what would sustain his practice? So he was not, he was never uh, thrilled by child prodigies and all that stuff. So my father used to, you know, funnily tell me when after concert when I was young, when I was eight or nine, when people used to say that your grandfather should have been alive to listen to your concert, he would say he won't be happy at all. <laughs> he would say that it's just by chance. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so that's about the practice. Okay. I guess I will go next, Kamprasad. And uh, before, I have a multifaceted uh, set of questions, Ram. But before I ask my questions, I just want to say, uh, I always get elated when I hear an authentic Palagat Shuri or a patient of Mari. So, in the last uh, answer, I am like, oh my God, finally I get to hear the authentic Palakkad lingo. So, 
not 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 many have that but you have somehow uh, it just came out naturally so, so. but anyways uh, um my first question is um, you know uh, mani ayer sir's view on on a concert we all know that he, he the, the gamut of people that he has uh, accompanied but uh, his views on you know accompanist right and i know when he was uh, you know in the speak uh, even though the vocalist were you know superheroes he was also at that time a part of the superhero concept right he was as as good as the main artist but personally do you know what his take was on the role of a mridangist and a violinist in a typical concert i mean uh, how important was it was it truly teamwork or did somebody carry it because there were references to in your in your earlier answer mridanga me kondu poi eduthu kacheri we have heard those statements violinists lal gudi sir vaacha gakanuma you know avar vaacha apiye poidum so but i'm sure uh, your tata had a view on things so just trying to get your view on it and then i'll have a few follow up not few at sure. least one <laughs> sure 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 so this is a very important and uh, important question i hope i'm able to address this clearly so that students of music will definitely benefit from this i mean he was always of the view that a concert was centered around the vocalist's output and he was always of the view that the role of violinist mridangist and the upapakadyam was to embellish the output of the vocalist as much as it was important for the violinist and the mridangist to show their talents in their space his his opinion was that and his strong belief and contention was that if the violinist or the mridangist does his part or her part greatly in the solo items in that in the items that they play separately are not able to embellish the music then in his words they were a failure as professionals so he used to say that there were several examples of violinists and the mridangas even in the past during even during his time let's not bring in names whom he used to say that their strength was to embellish other the part to poshich vasikarudu violin and mridangam you embellish the music they embellish the vocalists output and he used to throw off several names where he used to say that you can take this example this example this example who has fame who are famous because they were so good in accompanying the vocal in their turn probably they may not be as exemplary as many other artists were but still these violinists and mridangas were the most sought after because at the end of it if the vocalist was to pick a violinist or a mridangist he or she would want to pick someone who is going to contribute to the entire concert by embellishing their music right so he was he was of the opinion that mridangist violinist upapakavadyam their primary role was basically to do whatever it takes so he used to say that when i sit on stage the first thing i do is i gauge what the pluses and minuses of the vocalist are today because some vocalist might be really good in briga or speed but that day he or she might not be that good because it happens to everyone you are a human right so he used to say the moment i sit if i gauge this before the varnam i will know for a fact how i have to adapt myself so that the audience do not get a feel of what the shortcomings of the vocalist are he used to say na stage uttu velila kaaka pudikamaten stage la ipdi kaaka pudichiruven ella vocalist so and specifically to violinist so this i have heard also from tiruparkadal veeraagavan mama and alagiri sami pillai and uh, i think this also i shared on facebook uh, as one of the incidents i i don't remember but it's it's worth retreating at a million times as far as violinists are concerned i i i take it into separate pieces violinist and mridangas so as far as violinists uh, even tiruparakar veeravagaman and adigiri mama used to say that once uh, when uh, tiruparakar veeravagaman first was going to accompany uh, patama mami along with mani tata when he came in it seems he said uh, see whatever the vocalist sing follow a 60% rule if the vocalist sings a ragam for 10 minutes don't go beyond 6 minutes and if it is a popular vocalist like dkp or ms amma or mlv make it 40% <laughs> okay <laughs> he 
said he was strongly of the opinion that see first of all people have already been drenched with 10 minutes of whatever raga be it good or bad yeah. but they have been in that space for 10 minutes to rebuild everything from the scratch and match those 10 minutes is is a pressure on everyone right so it's it's a futile attempt one number two regardless of what the stage or this he used to say i could be balgat mani here you could have a lal godi you could have krishnan you could have you know, rajaman ikampadi could have anyone but somebody who comes back from a concert doesn't say that i came back from the concert of palgat mani here the reference is basically to vocalist they say that i came back from a concert of so and so who is a vocalist so that respect has to be completely maintained and he was of the opinion that this has to be the share that 60% rule or the 40% rule is something which he strongly believed in the other thing which he strongly believed in which we can actually decipher when we listen to the past concerts is the role of continuous bowing and violin so if you listen to past concerts it seems ramanjingar used to say this alegri mama said ramanjingar used to say that this is what even manitata apparently told him actually violin is a second tambura so the continuity that a violin provides in a concert is akin to what a tambura is it's like how tambura maintains a pitch the violin sapa actually has to maintain that throughout the concert so now we see lot of people uh, during the middle of the concert or even between two songs it's 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 natural for us to take a break but if you listen to the past concerts you will see that the violinist never used to take the bow off it used to be continuous so even for an unfamiliar song these days we i mean a lot of violinists take the bow off and they tend to listen i mean it could be for various technical reasons to probably they are not able to hear the vocalist properly or i mean a multitude of reasons but i am hard pressed to think that those those uh, shortcomings did not exist then so i i probably have to say that if you listen to the past concerts it will always be the violin the bow would be taken off right after the mangalam until then you start bowing it used to go on and on and on and on and on so he used to say that the continuity of a concert purely depends on the bowing of the violin so these are the two things so even a lot of violinists who come to me and uh, i mean who may teach i tell them that the most important thing is you may want to carefully listen to the vocalist while he is singing a new piece or could be a new adam in which he is singing a swaram or a nerval but don't take the bow off of the string have the continuity and you will after i mean after this if you go listen to the past concerts and compare to the current concerts you will clearly see this difference of continuity so that is some these are the two things and he has said many things but these are the two things which i think uh, young artists as violinists should definitely you know uh, try to follow and also vocalists probably if they have a good rapport with the violinists probably they can they can request them to follow this that is about the violinist mridangam he used to say that as i said before everything about part to poshikarudu in that regard he used to say that the least important thing for a murdangist has to be the taniyartham because to him taniyartham was a preordained thing you can bring it you can just place it and you can go right that's not about it and a very important thing that he used to say about accompanying for vocalists is that he used to say i have played for uh, let's say a simple example of vata pignapatam so he has played for vata pignapatam of let's say mdr uh, of gn sir of shamangudi of madhurmani here of ramanjinga he used to say if somebody says that you have to listen to mani here play for uh, mdr's vata pi or somebody says that you have to listen to mani here play for gn sir's vata pi the common thread he used to say is that why people like my playing for vata pi is because i don't play for vata pi i play for the vocalist because the padandaram is different the tempos are different and he used to say i mean across a vocalist and a violinist the vata pi he plays for like a, a lalgudi solo or krishna mama solo is different right he used to say like it's it's something which the the murdangas have to develop a taste and a ear for to say how i have to accompany raman singhar's vata pi vizavi and mdr's vata pi vizavi a kavian's vata pi and so on and so forth so he was very very particular about that he cannot think that just because the tempos are all the same you can just play and a very interesting anecdote here 
ஆலப்பழ வெங்கடேசன் மாமா ஒன்ஸ் ஆஸ்ட் மணி தாத்தா வைல் ஹி ஆஃப்டர் ஹிஸ் கான்சர்ட் இன் விச் ஹி சாங் ஹெச்எரிக்க காரா ஸோ ஹி ஆஸ் மணி தாத்தா டஸ் ராமாஞ்சிங்கார் புட் த தாளம் அஸ் கண்ட ஏக்கம் ஆர் அஸ் ஜம்ப் ஹி தாட் ஃபார் ஃபியூ செகண்ட்ஸ் அண்ட் ஹி செட் நான் அதெல்லாம் கவனிச்சதே இல்லையேப்பா ஹியர் லிட்ரலி நாட் கேர்ட் அபவுட் தட் all he cared about the, was the music that emanated from him and he just played for that and his his sense of 10 of that was 10 that's all it, you can you can call it as 50 or you can call it as 5 you can call it as 10 the divisor was like pretty straight forward it was like 5 okay so the remainder was 0 that's all he cared about all right so that is a very interesting and an, an important note for all budding artists because a lot of youngsters these days uh, when some you know senior artists senior mridangas play they come close to the main as if tanyavartanam is the only thing that they have to listen to but what they fail to understand is uh, shivaraman mama or ragu mama or murthy mama or trichy shankaran mama or ramabhadra mama who are their tvg mama who are they are they are they because they play for the music so well tanyavartanam is just one small aspect so that is something which we have to be extremely careful as students of music that when you try to go listen to a concert we have to have a holistic experience how the artist handle the entire show rather than their own part so he was very particular about this yeah so violin and mridangam no in fact what you just said is kind of a good prelude into what i wanted to ask because as a violinist um, you know sometimes we might be at the receiving end of some heavy heavy duty kanakis right mm-hmm. uh, and you might be able to relate to it right and i think you and i maybe have talked about this where um, there is a potential opportunity to as you said let's say for a taniyavartanam you know you can you can can it and play it at home 50 times and just reproduce it and ace it on stage great adhe mari kanaku thane kanaka nooru derka paadi you can uh, reproduce it on stage um but i wanted to where i was going with it is did did money uh, money sir have a view on uh, singing extensive kanakas or not even extensive kanakas or his view on vocalist singing kanakas to the point that it made i am sure he never got intimidated by it or he probably would as you said intimate intimidate the vocalist mm-hmm. but uh, his views on singing kanakas uh, in a concert right and so that's one part i'm sure uh, you will have a view or mama had a view on it the second part is uh, kind of uh, politically charged and i do want to talk about it is uh, the reason being at that time dt uh talk about nepotism or favoritism or uh anything during i mean we we were not uh, privy to any of those conversations because it is you know a couple generations ahead you know backwards so if you have any conversations around those two topics so sure so the first one it's, it's a, again a very interesting question and a very important one uh, for artists of all stage i would think he was of the view that entire kanak or the brahma line that he used to call lied entirely on sarvalagu he said that if an artist is not able to maintain a tempo in sarvalagu whatever kanak he sings is not valid because as you rightly said it's like pre it's prepared right if i have to sing a big kanak it's it's nothing i mean like it's like memorizing something and just for presenting it on stage i mean what right. is the challenge there there's absolutely no challenge and especially when you don't tell this up front to your vocal a violinist or the mridangist it doesn't make sense what what are they trying to prove there on stage like absolutely nothing right he used to say that kanak is reserved for mridangists okay and he believed that a smart kanak that a vocalist can handle is something which will extract the best of the violinist and the vocal of uh, uh, the mridangas to the extent that they may not be able to reproduce the kanaka but the kanaka should be followable enough for a reasonably smart violinist or a mridangas right. for it whether they are able to reproduce it so this will ensure that at the worst case probably they are not able to execute it but they are able to follow what you did so that is smartness okay so he used to say that 
So if you start something like Thakita, Thakadimi, Thakita, then obviously the next you would expect is a Thadiyan Kita, and the next yeah. would be Thadiyan Kita. Okay. So that is a reasonable kind of Kanaka or appropriation to have. But if you say something like Thakita, Tam, Thi, Tom, Thakita, I know what, how many actions I am giving. Yeah. Who knows? Right? And it's it's very convenient for me to manipulate the Thanam. You will not know whether I am giving seven akshrams or six akshrams. Right. I might be thinking I am I am giving six akshrams, but I, actually I might be giving seven in reality. But right. nobody would know. It is like like it's like painting something. It's drawing the sketch of my peripa and saying that this is my peripa. If you have not seen my peripa, you have to agree to it. Right. Right? But right. if I say this is Gandhi ji, he will spit at me. Right? <laughs> right. So. Taking something which is unfamiliar and which is only privy to me and presenting in a concert is, it's, first of all, it's, it's, it's not even ethical in my opinion. And uh, of course, I'm saying this because I mean, obviously, I mean, he had this view and I completely, it's, it's reasonable to think the same way. And in fact, one interesting uh, incident is, so during the 60s, uh, when Manitata, Arathur Subayar, Arathur Srinivasayar, and uh, Patama Mami were judging a Ragandana Pallavi competition, which was a prestige symbol in academy those days. So he went there. And uh, there were a lot of entries on like so many different types of talons and all that stuff. So he listened to the first two or three, and they were all very complicated and all that stuff. He just got fed up. With the fifth participant, he said, listen, I don't want any kanak. What is the premise of Ragandana Pallavi? After you sing Ragandana, you have to sing Naraval for a Pallavi. Naraval is what the key is, right? So take a simple Pallavi, Aditalam Pallavi, perhaps Samayadam and sing some basic <laughs> Naravals. I want to listen to Naravals. Right. Okay. So he said that that is the true test. Like maintaining the tempo is what is Brahmalaya. In this context, he used to say, uh, this gets back to Dekshamurthy Pillai, uh, Roger sir, since you asked earlier. He used to say, Chembe and Dekshamurthy Pillai had this unique Brahmalayam concept, which is, uh, I'll slightly distract and get back to this point. I'll try to slightly deviate and come back to this point. So Dakshinamurthy Pillai, when he gets into a mood, suddenly he will start Tati Kedatam from wherever in the Thalam. While the, while the singer, while the vocalist or the violinist is playing. So I might be singing like, I can be singing this. He will suddenly start Tati Kedatam, Tati Kedatam, Tati Kedatam. So he, he used to have such a command on the stage that if he starts Tati Kedatam, I have to sing Tati Kedatam. I have to sing. I have to keep on going. So Manitada used to say that, I mean, he didn't care about the vocalist, he didn't care about the violinist. He used to take five somewhere. Okay. But the point is, that's what he used to say. It's not that he took undue advantage of that, because whatever he did used to contribute to the success of the concert. It could be like a one man show or whatever it is. At the end of it, whatever he did, it would have contributed positively to the success of the concert and people would be elated with the output, finally. So, I mean, getting back to this fives, he used to say, suddenly he'll start. So the fives will keep on going because, I mean, it had no end. He would be happy playing this Tati Ketutam. And Manitata used to say, it is very easy in Kanchira or uh, Mardangam because at any speed, all he has to do is Tat Tam, Tat Tam, Tat Tam. He doesn't even have to do Tati right, But the right. vocalist has to say this, Tati Gama Pari, Gama Pada, Gama Pada, Gama Pada, Nita Pada. He had to keep on going. And he used to say that Chembai and uh, Dakshinamurthy Pillai, they both had this Brahma line that they knew that the Adam was going to come like about some seven or eight seven or five eight. before that. Right. So he used to say until then that the fives will be tat tam, tat tam, tom tom, tat tam, dim dim, tat tam. The last six or seven, they used to make a feast out of it. Saying tat travatam, tat travatam, tat travatam, tat because they know exactly after the five or six fives, you are going to get to the Adam. Right. But that's what he used to say. Chembai and uh, Dachshan Pradipali used to sink. And some violinists used to sink. But if you had no clue about this, or let's say for Vata Bhaganapadim, the last three fives were, if I did not know, Sare Gaba Gare Gabani Bhagabani Sari, and I had to start Vata Bhaganapadim. Yeah. Where will I start? Sare Gaba Gare Gabani Bhagabani Sari, Vata <laughs> But those with Brahmalayam, they used to know that, okay, this we are getting to the end of it and we have to be closer to the range of Vata Bhaganapadim, so it doesn't sound Not like that. extremely odd. Yeah, exactly. So this, this was his concept of Lyme. His concept of Lyme was maintaining the tempo and having a vision of where the atoms were 
and even when you place a kanak or whatever it is a solu or whatever it is you had to know the placement of he used to call that talam as rails and if you are placed in those rails exactly you can you can carry through so that was his, he used to say that it's it, it's it's a never ending process the lime is a never ending process you have to get to it you cannot draw it to yourself you have to get to it so this was his concept of kanak and he was never a, a great admirer of a lot of kanakas that people do as pre position and come and vomit on stage yeah. uh, in fact one incident which i vividly remember when i was like 13 or 14 um, uh, i had a concert and the violinist uh, i mean he was not an exemplary kanaka person right but i had prepared some kanaka some kanda kanda korappu that i had prepared and uh, i sang and i the moment i got into the car right after the concert my father unleashed he said do you think that i'm saying all these stories about mani tata for for fun or for entertainment this is exactly what you're not supposed to do when you know for the first turn that the violinist was not able to follow wouldn't you be adept enough to just yeah. change the course and make it convenient for everyone at the end of it unless the way the violinist the murdangas and the upapakadiyam are like comfortable i mean the concert effect is not going to it's not going to come yeah. off it's going to be a personal achievement which you can tell only yourself who's going to know at the end of it people are going to say the ram prasad concert was not good they will not know that because the violinist of the murdangas weren't good right. they will say the concert wasn't good right yeah. so i mean i i vividly remember the scoldings that i got i mean like i got it for like the next one week she was like <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i remember that so his uh, manitada's ideology was extract the best extract the most of the violinists and the murdangas push right. them to the limit but never go beyond what their frontiers are i mean that that doesn't help anyone right and the vocalist has to be smart enough to judge that because we all know i mean we have we have been on stage like people who are usually good at kanak that day may not be like that that may not be the day or people who are you know attuned to sudhi so much that concert it might just not happen so if I, if i'm not good i mean that day if it doesn't happen that i'm i'm not attuned to sudhi i cannot take a sahana or a kedara kodu and try to sing that rishabha and devadam like yeah. <laughs> honestly right. this is a mistake right. right. so uh, this so back to that so kanak he was he was he was extremely against this pre-planned and this elaborate kanakas and all that he was like it has to be smart enough for any reasonably smart person to follow that was his view okay so, so the second part uh, any views on i don't think so it was as blatant as probably it is now but nepotism and favoritism mm-hmm. and 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 you know we can just brush it under the blanket and say those things don't exist but i think the whole idea of a forum like this is actually talk about things that actually exist right and totally. i might be frowned upon by the majority of the audience saying you know why do you want to talk about things but i think this is a reality we at least should spend a few minutes hmm. totally on. totally totally see uh, the one thing i mean obviously i'm not going to get into names but he has had several references of names um and we all know for a fact that nepotism and favoritism exists in all fields in oh, several yeah. flavors and you know in several colors i mean there is no denying uh, right. i mean i mean even our five fingers are not the same right exactly so right. obviously there are going to be differences in personalities there are going to be differences in the content there is going to be a mismatch between the vidvat vidvat and the popularity i mean we have instances even in the past right. like where relative to the other singers where those vocalists were not considered as high in vidvat by other artists because i mean we have two sections right one is the artists and one is the rasikas right uh, i mean there are certain unique situations in which both the rasikas and uh, the co artists are an of the artist right for their capabilities right usually it is like typically it's more of a mass than of the caliber sometimes it's more of a caliber than of a mass so it's usually that imbalance so they, they were in the past and it still exists and it is going to exist obviously in the future that you cannot say that people's uh, you know popularity is strictly based on their vidvat is is i mean uh, it's almost blasphemous to even think of it as an ideal it's not, it's never right. going to happen right. and during his stage even during his era previous era he has come out with so many names saying that i mean that that person was so popular but actually this person was more you know he was he was the actual vidwan with compared to other person right so i mean this nepotism favoritism and there were certain places even within uh, i can i can definitely tell you this in tirunelveli those who are 
uh, those who are from Tirunelveli would definitely know this. There were three kachis. One kachi, one party was Ramanajangar party. The other party was Shamagudi party. The other was GMP party. Okay. Basically, these were like three gramams. That's right. right. Set up households. People who like Shamangudi had to hate the other two. <laughs> and the turn goes on. Right? Right, right. So typically, my <laughs> Tata used to say, typically it used to happen that these three concerts used to happen in the Tepam. Right? And <laughs> three concerts, the first concert would be of Raman Jingar, then would be of Jiyan Sir, and then would be of Shamangudi. And invariably, there were so many situations in which Manitata used to accompany for all the three concerts. All three. Right. And invariably, it used to be the same main, something like a right. Sri Supermaster, let's say. Right. Okay. <laughs> he used to say, after staying in the first gramam, I used to go to the next gramam, where people used to be like so disdainfully talking about the Sri Supermaster of the previous day. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but he used to say, despite all this, everyone would come to everyone's concert. Right. They clearly knew that whatever they were saying was basically out of pure affiliation and pure you know, favoritism and it had nothing to do with the with what, right? right? So even if it can happen at that level, I'm talking about like at the Rasikas level, those days. Uh, so it's it should not come as a surprise that favoritism or nepotism did not exist previously. Perhaps the one thing which we can definitely say is the factors that contributed to the popularity of an artist was predominantly talent those days. If you think about what it is today, I may probably say that it could be pre it could be pre you know uh, completely because of my bias, but I stand by my opinion. Okay, my opinion is that today there are several other factors. It's the personality that counts. If I were to have the personality of my Manitata, where he mean he didn't even entertain a conversation with people, probably like uh, you know I cannot sustain in the field. I have to be a bit more cordial, and probably Manitata's predecessors did not even do what Manitata did. Right. So Manitata and Jiyan were probably the first to bring in like uh, this kind of the stylish crop uh, in a concert, the stylish crop hairstyle they used to call. So until then it was all Kurimi, say they brought in a change. So perhaps that, that added some value, which his predecessors might not have been very comfortable with. They would have said that, you know what, he's trying to gather some popularity by doing these things. So with, as time goes by, obviously in the timeline, there are going to be several changes and there are going to be certain things which you might be fine with, certain things which you may not be fine with. But the constant is that while talent is always an eternal thing that defines your popularity and all that, the or other the, the sidelines are much more these days. Uh, uh, let's say there is yet another artist who is as good as me, but probably doesn't have the personality that is... Um, let's say I have a personality which is which is extremely conducive for dealing for concerts and all that stuff and the other person doesn't have obviously I'm going to be preferred over that person everything remains the same everything else being the same I'm going to be preferred so this nepotism favoritism everything had existed in the past it is existing today and there is no reason why it wouldn't ex uh, you know exist in the future too the one thing is the advantage the advantage today we have is that we clearly know there is so much of evidence that this is purely out of uh, nepotism and favoritism because the social media is blaring out of whatever I am capable of. If I think that I am the best in singing, uh, let's say, uh, Meenakshi Memudam, you will listen to my YouTube clip and say that, boss, this is what you are calling Meenakshi Memudam. <laughs> <laughs> so the evidence is right out there. So that is the flip side. Thanks, uh, very informative. So um, it's been great so far. I know, can't believe one hour is gone already, right? So um, I have read uh, Ram Prasad that um, during Parani Subramani Pillai's uh, house form Gaha Pravesham, uh, he invited uh, uh, your granddad uh, to play, uh, I believe it was uh, Madhuri Maniya's concert, right? So uh, I'm sure it would have been uh, some great cordial relationship between the two. But right, you talked about uh, Nadal Sutterer. So always people like uh, to love to talk about, you know, the Nadal Sutterer kind of professional uh, rivalry kind of thing, right? So I want to hear uh, what what did you hear from your Tata on his relationship with uh, Pioneer, of course, and also uh, all his other uh, contemporary movements. Sure, sure. So uh, I mean, it's well documented. It's right out there the kind of mutual respect that Manitata and Pioneer what had. So I'm not going to elaborate much on that because uh, it was almost a given that both of them, their respect for each other was not even explainable by others. 
on those days this gets back to the point of uh, certain issues outside of music jay since you brought this earlier there were certain artists who were actually wanting to purge on this because they weren't fine with the kind of cordial relationship and the mutual respect that manikatha and painiwal had right so they used to come up with several stories just to break this bond correct and most often it did not work of course there were a few instances where it it worked but then it got patched up because their respect was like so true that uh, nothing could actually hurt it hurt the relationship right okay. so uh, there are several personal incidents uh, that i can i can go on and on and on but something which is definitely not documented uh, which you will not find let me just uh, talk about that this also shows the innocence of pine wood so manitata always i mean he had a great respect for pine wood and he he also used to say that when all the other musicians he it's it's in his terms are so venomous including himself are so venomous he is one person who is so innocent uh, to the extent of being naive okay he wouldn't, he wouldn't even know how to uh, how to be how to be over smart on certain things where you had to be as artists or as public figures sometimes you you have to be he never cared about that his innocence was like it shone through so this was one interesting incident which my appa told me few days back so it seems in one of the marriage concerts in uh, trichy uh, first was gn sir's concert so anand alauj kitapayar had also accompanied them so kitapayar gn sir uh, i think violin was rajamanikam pillai manitha thondam mrudangam and payani ward on the kanjira so the concert was supposed to start at 5 and it ended at around 9:30 which was followed by the procession of nadasuram where meenakshi sundaram pillai was was playing on the tabla Uh, so this was in 50s i guess uh, late 40s or 50s um so even before gnsr's concert started gnsr and kitappa mama had decided that they are going to attend the uh, nadasuram procession so first they asked uh, manitata and painiwal uh, so manitata it seems that manitata did not respond for some reason and painiwal said that uh, he might decide right after the concert since the concert went for about like 4 or 5 hours right after the concert uh, again gn sir and kitappa mama uh, had come to manitha than asked are you coming he said i am not coming i am tired so he went to his room then they asked pine is going to play uh, so are you coming we both are going and they almost suggested that he should come he said uh, he the first thing he asked is uh, money are all coming they said no he said uh, if he is not coming even i will also take a break why should i come but after that they said okay and then they talked among themselves because i mean this josh was coming down with uh, neither manitha or painiwal in the procession uh, for them to go alone uh, <laughs> just the two of them with uh, neither paini or uh, manitha was like it was sagging the thrill was sagging for them so they they planned on something okay so they tricked paini by going and telling him that uh, see i had to tell you something about the concert the concert uh, uh, manier was extremely impressed and all that and then paini wala asked did he say anything about my playing which no other court should ask especially when these two are rivals why would they ask that that shows his innocence okay <laughs> so he asked did manier wala tell anything about me playing they said uh, you know in fact that's that's the reason why we have come here to talk to you about uh, he said the, the playing was exemplary but he strongly felt that uh, if you if you were to listen to meenakshi sundaram pillai a bit more you will get a lot of ideas and you will get inspired and uh, actually you know what the solus will actually favor your kind of play he said who oh, is it is it true he said yeah absolutely that's why we came here he said okay then i'll come for the procession okay <laughs> <laughs> so what happened it so happened that they went for the procession uh, the narasuram procession after two two and a half hours gn sir and kitappa mama got tired okay he <laughs> <laughs> said that okay let's go sleep paini wala is no 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 you have to be here <laughs> manier wala is asking me to listen to this <laughs> yes sir <laughs> so they had to end up until 2 or 3 in the morning and listen to the entire procession <laughs> then they went to sleep so the next morning uh, when mani dada had asked them like uh, where was paini and why he was still sleeping <laughs> they said that he had gone with them and then he said the paini wala said that he was not going there <laughs> then gn sir explained that this is what we did <laughs> then you went to paini wala and said no i didn't say anything there was no talk about the concert it's all their story <laughs> <laughs> so th- this is the kind of mutual respect that they had i mean just because he thought money money year had suggested something he took it in face value and he thought that that had to be true so that is a kind of magnanimity probably i should say that they had and the respect that they had for each other
Okay, uh -huh. wonderful. Thank you. So I'll take the next question. Uh, so informal arthak, you know, Tamil uh, uh, Shankar so one hour one day So uh, I think we have another set of questions. So uh, so talking about Maniya uh, your illustrious life, pati nama base no, abroad Mridangam Vedpat pati base no. Uh, he is the real Mridanga Chakravarti, uh, the king of Mridangam. But other Tavara, our own Mridanga Tavara, our own life, le, how has he inspired you? And our uh, own life, le, what do you think is his greatest achievement in life? Which is there for now? So, uh, literally, Manitata Mridanga Tavara Baki, do material. Honestly speaking, uh, he did not know that he had to sit right across the light for him to be seen or the light had to be on the object that he was reading. So my party used to position him in such a way that he is able to even read books with proper lighting. He used to say, how, how do you know this? Like, I mean, it might come across as really funny to us, but our thinking is And he never used to dry his clothes, Puriyamatar Tuniya, because he felt that the Mridhatamam of the fingers will he might lose it. Tapa Podamatar, he never used to latch the doors because what if it cuts or whatever. Kai Kudukamatar Yarkam. So, I mean, everything that he did was around Mardangam playing. So, it's a known thing that uh, his hobby was changing houses, right? So, that's what my party used to say. I mean, nobody can question him because suddenly he will say that after three months in a house, he will say that Ide So everybody had to keep quiet. I mean, it's about his murdangam. Who can question that? I mean, who is going to say what about this house that, that you are not able to play murdangam? Nobody can question him. So I mean, he used to have his way. So everything was about murdangam. Um, see, the one thing which I definitely take away is the professional dignity and the commitment that he had and the respect that he had in this field. He had no compromises and his truthfulness in the field. He never, not even once has, I mean, at least that I know of uh, either my peripa or my father telling uh, that he had accepted on a concert but did not play. There has been not even one incident of that. And even during his uh, deathbed, when he lost his consciousness, he had accepted an advance remuneration for a concert of Mali. Even after he lost his consciousness, he said that I had to return that money and he exactly knew how much advance that he had he had gotten from the Sabha. He said that I have taken this advance for Mali's concert that has to be returned. I mean, that is recorded. I, I have the proof. He had lost, lost all his consciousness, but still he said this. So this kind of professionalism and the dignity that he maintained. And one simple example is uh, while he was having a concert in Bombay, on I don't remember the exact date or the year. Let's say it was some May 15th. I'm just making this up. So while he just accepted that concert, uh, he got a uh, he got a uh, at, uh, he got a telegram from Pune Sabha asking for the same day. Let's say it was May 15th. So he asked his secretary to reply saying that he was not free. He didn't even say that May 15th I'm playing in Bombay so that he can have it either on the 14th or the 15th. So uh, when uh, Babu sir asked him, you can just add a line saying that you are in Bombay so that they can have the concert there. He said that they should ask. They should ask where I am. And as a reply, if I say that I am in Bombay, then it's their decision to either have the concert in Pune the previous or the other day. So this is the kind of respect that he maintained in the field. So uh, I know for a fact that I completely internalized since a very small, since a very young age that it is it is almost impo it's not almost it's impossible to match his with with or his caliber but i definitely can hold on to these principles as a musician and in that regard i definitely would like to follow his uh, follow the kind of lifestyle that he led with respect to the dignity that he had in this profession and the dignity that he gave back to the profession so a lot of people used to say that he brought in dignity to the profession and i'm pretty sure that these kinds of um, you know incidents actually contribute a whole lot to uh, the professional dignity as such 
So that is something which inspires, inspires me a lot. This is just one incident, like there are millions of others. So the offstage behavior, the offstage respect that he commanded through his behavior, that is something which, uh, which I would, I would, I would just want to follow to the T. I think Roger, you're on mute. Yeah. Did I unmute it? Yes. Yeah, now, okay. now you're okay. Now you're okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. Actually, this is uh, more exciting than attending to a, a concert, you know. So I have attended a lot of concerts. Maybe I should do more of this instead of regular concerts. Um, you know, I talked to Sundaram, sir, about, you know, this event. And I asked him, what advice do you give me? He says, every sentence you speak, there should be a verb and there should be a noun and then Cleveland or other noun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, even otherwise, I was going to ask this question. Uh, you know, the uh, one of the main focus of Cleveland or uh, is to encourage quite a lot of children in North America to take up Carnatic music. So um, fortunately, there are hundreds and hundreds of children who are taking up uh, Carnatic music. And quite interestingly, most of them, uh, they are learning via uh, social media, like Skype or Facebook or and so on. It's like a, they don't have the luxury that some of you had you know, with the Gurukulam. Uh, some of them, they go back to India in summer, spend three months with the guru and so on. Um, so you managed to excel in academics as well as in Carnatic music and quite a lot of the children are trying to follow the same pattern. They, they have the pressure from the parents to do very well in academics. And then in addition to that, they have to excel in Carnatic music. So what advice would you give for them to excel in both, which you have done? Well, I, I hope my professors are not watching this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't excel in academics, to be honest. Uh, probably uh, I studied for quite a bit, that's all. Yeah, so the one thing which I was, I'm, I was extremely clear about was center my day around two things. One is music and the other is probably fitness. Uh, so this 45 minutes of fitness and about one and a half hours of music was a constant. So if it entailed me to wake up 3 a.m., I do that. If it gives me the luxury of waking up at 6, 6.30, it's still fine. But it's absolutely important to anchor what you want to do and plan everything around it. Probably I, I do it. Uh, I mean, I'm probably on the other other end of the spectrum in terms of being extremely meticulous about it. You don't have to be extremely meticulous, but as long as you have a clear road plan that you're not missing out on any of your routine, of any one or two things that you are doing. Let's say you are doing you are doing your masters or you are doing your PhD, and you are probably learning violin or clarinet or whatever. Uh, it only makes sense and it is only fair that you spend that one or one and a half hours of practice in clarinet or violin or piano or whatever it is and ensure that that gets done. I mean, I mean, it's very easy to come up with excuses. You can always say that you had a test. You can always say that you had like a meeting you had. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's so easy, but that becomes a habit. I mean, uh, that is the one thing. It's, it entails uh, quite a bit of self-discipline. And if you, ex if you expect external motivation, that that's not going to work. That's my opinion. If you think that you need someone to tell you what you need to do, I don't think it's going to work. Unless otherwise you internalize it as a part of your life and be committed. Because I mean, I'm pretty sure the kind of uh, pain that the students take, the parents take, right, with respect to time, the effort and all that stuff, especially in the US, and um, especially when it entails driving for four and a half hours or five hours during weekends, because I've had students, you know, come from different states during the weekends, 
come learn from me and go back and drive back like four or five hours or six hours or whatever. I mean, you, you are putting so many people's time and effort uh, on the table, right? It's not just yours, it's your parents. It's an emotional in investment too. It's not like they're going to be fine with you like being like uh, the, the way they show in the films or in the movies where you just go to the you know, puja room and say, I mean, they need something tangible. Obviously, they are going to be happy if you perform a concert and nothing wrong in aspiring for a concert. If you are doing what it takes to perform a concert, then why not aspire for it? I mean, I am not of the view that you have to learn music for the sake of music without even you know, having concert in mind. Yes, that cannot be the reason for you to learn music for sure. But aspiring to perform, uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong in it. I mean, like what is wrong in that? Put in the effort, aspire for it. If it takes like six hours or seven hours of practice, do it. And if you don't get it, feel bad about it. So what? So I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned the word movies. Uh, in this day and age, there is a tendency on some of good young, talented musicians to be distracted by the glamorous side of Carnatic music, uh, when their goal should be to the in-depth classism side of the Carnatic music. So how do you, what advice do you give for them not get distracted by the glamorous side? See, the one thing is, uh, instead of just putting uh, the blame on the person per se, probably the guru or the mentor has to clearly lay down a path. They should say that uh, at any point in time, there are going to be distractions. So the distractions in music or distraction in any field is like age old as Vishwamitra. Right? Even if Vishwamitra had a distraction, what about me? Okay. Everyone is going to have distractions. Uh, it's, it's purely the role of the mentor to clearly lay down the path and say that, you know what, uh, you have everything around you. The role of the mentor has to be like what it is for parents. They have to ensure that the student makes the right choice. Right Now, there are going to be like a 15 million people jumping out and saying, how do you know what is good? How do you know what is bad? I mean, because we are in an era of questioning everything, right? So people jump into, jump up and say that, you know what, who, who gives you the moral pedestal to say, call something good or bad? Well, the way it has worked conventionally in this field is that you listen to your guru, that's all. Then you can start questioning whether Tyagaraja actually composed Entero Mahana Paolo, were you there physically? <laughs> well, uh, there has to be, this system works on faith, right? Total Sharanagadi on the guru. Right? Total Sharanagadi means like, yeah, you are my guru, I will follow what you say. And during the journey, you pick up a few things and your guru can take you and he can lay down the, you know, the rubric and the structure. Generally, you have to follow these things. And as an individual, obviously, your experiences are not going to be extremely 100% the same that your guru had. Probably your guru is not even a performing artist. You don't know. So the way you pick up things is not going to be the same as what your guru did. But you should be smart enough to say that, you know what, this is the track that my guru has given, right? These are the experiences that I have. Does it almost fall in the periphery of these tracks or is it like totally outside of it that it's even worth exploring, right? And if you think of the kind of, uh, you know, stalwarts that have blessed this field, someone like Raman Jingar or GN sir, I mean, or an MS, did they have distractions? Obviously they had. But do we ever question them on their classicism? Probably not. Do they ever question them on their uh, intent? No. Do we ever question them on their objective of making a mark the right way? We don't. Do we ever question them on being a mass appealer but not actually producing the vidva that you know any artist would expect? No. So when you have these kinds of, I mean, uh, GNs are or money here, they, they live the life of like what probably Rajini Gantar and Amitabh Bachchan lived. It was no different, right? They could have, they could have easily gotten distracted. For the kind of physical personality that GNs are had, he, I mean, he could have he could have thrived as a like a hero right? in in movies. I mean, he could be like a total star. But I mean, he knew what he he had to do. So it is very easy to you know compromise your long term goals for short term pleasures. You will see the short term hikes as like that's the end of life. But it's it's actually the marathon that you are running. It's it's not a hundred meter race, right? So you have to be careful and equally responsible are the gurus and the parents and the environment that you have around you. I mean, I might have like a 15 people who are next to me saying that, you know what, you have to be more aggressive in social media, but ultimately it's my choice, right? 
i can choose to be like however i want on social media i can choose to be like whatever i want to do but as an individual i have my own principles whatever those principles are i mean you may consider those principles are low or somebody might consider that but there is generally a trend uh, so if you start questioning you can start questioning but everyone knows for a fact at least to them what is okay and what is not and a lot of times we go against whatever our will says and that's where the problem lies and a lot of responsibility i cannot iterate this further gurus who i mean it starts from the fact that gurus are okay with some shoddy performance and they send them for arangetra and it starts from there right especially i mean i should not be saying this but i have to say this it's an uncomfortable topic but a lot of students from the us i mean uh, they want to perform and uh, the gurus are perfectly fine with that but with the, the gurus ask themselves if their gurus were fine if they had done the same job if that kind of sincerity and uh, you know uh, if that kind of honesty were to prevail then you wouldn't let these uh, you know toddlers in terms of experience just go on stage for a 3 year concert and again this concept of marketing this arangetram and all that stuff as a 3 hour concert to me i mean 3 hour concert is a big deal right i mean you have to know for a fact that they are people are sitting for the 3 hours for your parents for the kind of goodwill and the relationship that your parents have created <laughs> not because you are an ms or an mlb that people come for your music and that has to be drilled into their minds because at the end of it it ends up being like a statement in your sop for your college admits i have performed a 3 hour concert and you just write a paragraph about it enhancing your college admits that's that's how it ends right i mean but if you question it and the gurus and the parents when parents howl upon the gurus to say that you know what uh, when uh, when is my to uh, when is my child ready for an arangetram they the guru has to cut it cut it like from the root and saying that you know what let him or her start from a 20 minute performance because 20 minutes is a big deal if you, i mean in my opinion if you have to sing a 20 minute concert you have to prepare for like 7 months 7 to 8 months to give a reasonable performance even today let me tell you my uh, 2019 was the first time in my 32 years of concert performance that my co- my father was okay with me singing shankarabarnam i knew like 21 22 songs in shankarabarnam he said that you are you are not ready your voice is not ready to handle the depth so it took so long for me and at one point in time i asked him like then why did you teach me these these many songs he said that or at least by that you will you'll get better he did not <laughs> <laughs> right so the role of guru is absolutely important and the concept of getting on to stage with an arangetram of 3 hours that has to be it has to be it, it has to be cut i mean it's not easy it's not easy for a trained musician to to carry off a 3 hour concert right so it has to start very organically like how it used to be in the past like we, people used to sing in agandams like two or three songs in fact my first concert was based on agandam singing dkj mama was there but vijay shiva i mean he says that no that didn't happen but dkj mama has told me he listened to me singing in an agandam in 87 1987 86 or 87 ah uh, in purushavakam tyagaraj utsavam i just sang like two or three songs i sang one paramatmudu so he was extremely impressed with it we used to frequently go to all these visit all these uh, musicians like uh, ragu mama house to shivaman mama house you know uh, to lalpuri mama house krishna mama everyone's house so we once once we went to dkj mama house and uh, we said like uh, it looks like you only asked vijay shiva to you know have uh, prasad concert i mean i i was not even eight when i did my first concert so he said that i mean i, I could see from the from the songs that he handled I mean it's not on me of course everything my father taught so basically it goes to him but i'm saying that's how organically it comes so my first concert was like 45 minutes or 15 minutes i don't even know so even for my students that what I, that's what i say i mean don't ask for a 3 hour concert because it takes a lot even today if somebody asks for a request i mean i cannot sing a concert on stage uh, a song on stage without practicing for like 500 or 600 times i i don't get that confidence so it's so easy for some of the youngsters to learn something this morning and just present it that evening i mean i'm like is it even possible if it's even humanly possible i mean uh, i mean even for one of the recent uh, recent concerts that happened like last week i had like 10 day or 15 day window and all the songs were the three songs were pretty new i ensure that at least one day it's not about manodharma manodharma i mean i'm expected to come up with manodharma so it's not about the manodharma it's the song it's the way you sing the song it's the way you sing the sangatis it could be a simple song it if, if, if take a simple example of meenakshi meemadam it has just one sangathi in the pallavi 
can you believe it but to bring the depth of meenakshi memadam by just singing that one sangati is where the true vidwat is and what it takes it takes like years of practice so before you bring a song on stage at least it has to be done like 700 or 800 times for you to to get that feel of the song even if i have to sing one song like let's say a tirupavai or something like that that day i will practice it for at least like 15 20 times i never practice manodharma i practice that tirupavai it could be like 2 minutes but even if one person is not doing something but listening to you you have to respect that and the respect you can give is by ensuring that you practice as much as possible so i think role of guru parents and cutting off this arangetram thingy for whatever commercial reasons it could be would go a long way in ensuring what it takes to perform a concert because these guys think that think that okay when they see someone performing on stage they think that even i have done it no you have not done it <laughs> so that has to be very clear in everyone's mind thank you uh sri ram i know we are going through the panel one by one but i just want to ask you for time uh i i can skip the my my portion is what i was trying to offer oh go for it okay. if, uh, if sri ram prasad is okay with uh, the time let's uh, go through it. i know it was like a one and a half hour program and we might be running uh, i'm done with my dinner so i'm okay <laughs> <laughs> Yeah this okay, is I'll, like so I'll, much fun i didn't even know it's like one and a half hours fast so okay then i'll i'll take the offer then uh, i was trying not to ask a technical question but the mridangam artist in me is going to make <laughs> me ask a technical question if you don't mind ram prasad uh, i wanted to no manier's preference on kappi mridangam versus kuchi mridangam i know it's a very technical mridangam term uh, but i know at least what i have heard is all about kappi sound that he prefers as or what i'm assuming but uh, just his opinion or his preference on the sound of the mridangam yeah so just for lay audience so this kuchi uh, mridangam gives you this reincarnation sound so the resonance stays for a longer time on the valantalai compared to a kappi mridangam so that's basically the difference in terms of what you can discern as a layman between a kappi and a kuchi mridangam so yeah as you rightly said he is his preference was only for kappi and not for kuchi and um, it's basically at the end of it it boils down to individual preferences so his one side of opinion of people preferring kuchi was the ease of maintenance he felt that if that was the case then that cannot be the reason for preferring kuchi over kappi if if it takes to maintain a kappi mridangam and you prefer kappi mridangam do what it takes do what it takes to maintain a kappi mridangam right and a very interesting story so while he was 8 or 9 years old there were two mridangam workers one who was extremely close to his house and the one which was like few miles away from his house both were extremely good in their mridangam making and uh, you know mridangam repair and all that stuff but the one who was farther away from his house at the end of repairing he used to say that i am going to do some polish he used to say yam polish cheyam bona okay and he used to ask uh, manitata to stay away from where he is doing this polish stuff and manitata had to wait in the sun for about 30 to 40 minutes so that he does some kind of a polishing and when that mridangam comes out it used to shine okay and he, for just for the shine otherwise both these mridangam repairer was just the same okay they were equally adept in their jobs but for this extra polishing stuff he used to wait in the hot sun for 30 40 minutes and walk down few more miles right carry the mridangam on his shoulders i mean those those days hey, he, he he didn't know to ride cycles or whatever so he used to carry the mridangam on his shoulders two mridangams on the shoulders walk down few miles so that he sees this so the contention is basically you know for the fact that something takes extra effort but the output is also something which you even slightly prefer don't worry about the marginal cost and the marginal benefit go for the one which you which gives you more benefit he was he was of that opinion and as far as the ease of handling as you know obviously the kuchi mridangam is definitely easy to handle and easy to maintain and um, again reiterating as much as he had a preference his opinion was that ease of maintenance cannot be a reason for preferring one over the other
Ram, I'm going to uh, something you just mentioned in the last statement, kind of. I think it's our uh, financial background that comes into play. We talk okay. about marginal cost and marginal benefit. I'm like, oh my God. Uh, so in your perspective, uh, this law of marginal returns actually work in music. And, and your thoughts on it, right? And because at the end of it, you know, it, it relates to what you said, right? If, if you're truly passionate about five things, and you mentioned about you need to work out, you need to have music, you know, obviously all of us have family responsibilities and such. So there is like five, six buckets that are indispensable for us, right? But uh, having said that, uh, you know, how would, how would law of marginal returns, do we have to worry about that? Your personal, your personal sure. thoughts on it. Yeah, so a, a lot of it depends on the background that you have. So for example, the curve is going to be much steeper if you don't have a background. Because besides music, there are so many other things that you may have to pick on the way. Starting from the way you deal with people around music, it could be organizers, it could be co-artists, it could be rasikas, it could be your murtangam repairers, or it could be, you know, uh, tambura players. I mean, because a person with a background, by definition, has some knowledge of how to handle these issues, right? So one major chunk of it is off. The only thing that he or she has to focus on is music. So in that regard, the returns are going to be much higher in the initial stages because that is the only thing that is the only focus for you but a person with no background has to think of these things so that is going to obviously you know encroach your practice time the core time for music so that is something which you have to be careful about the one positive side that a person with no background has vis-a-vis -vis someone let's say my example i'll just take my example a person with background and a person who is so initiated in listening to concerts only pre-60s. Honestly speaking, I would say that the number of concerts that I would have heard post-70s or post-60s, either live or recorded or whatever, could be less than 0.05%. I'm not making this up. So the concerts that I've listened to is predominantly, yeah, all of the brothers, Shamanguri Sinasir, Chambai, Rama Jangar, brothers, MDR, KV, these are the, these are the ones that I've listened to. So the downside to it is, even though a person could be really great today singing, let's say there is one person who he or she who is like really, really good. My standards are like certain Rama and Jengars are KVNs. So obviously, even someone like KVN could not match Rama and Jenga standard when they both were alive. And that's the reason it took so long for KVN to come to come to stage or come to fore because people were so much ahead of him, right? So for me, the downside is I can definitely appreciate and uh, you know applaud or I can, I can really respect some musician, but not as much as they deserve for a normal person or a person without background, right? My obvious standards of comparison is going to be, it includes me. Obviously, when I sing a Raja Vedala, it's going to be like a piece of trash because I know for a fact that I've listened to Raja Vedala of Rama and Jinga like a million times. So when am I going to come close to that? It's, it's not going to happen, right? So my worry is all about a person with a background is always going to worry about the standards that he or she has and the eternal struggle of not able to reach it and completely well aware of it. Yeah. I'm totally yeah. aware of the fact that it's not going to match. So that way the returns are going to be much lesser or the perceived returns are going to be much lesser. I may think that the way that I practice, I, I practice like five hours or six hours a day and see, look at the kind of music that I'm producing. Probably it's good sounding to all, all you guys, but it's, it's not to me. So personally, it's a, it's a failure for me. Right. So again, it depends on what metric you use to define these returns. If the returns are defined in terms of tangible things, in terms of what music you're producing, I think it's all going to be the same. But if you're talking about returns with respect to a holistic attitude as to, you know, uh, popularity with respect to what other musicians say, with respect to the kind of visibility that I get, then it's going to obviously depend on so many other factors. And I would strongly urge not to think in those lines because that's totally not in our control. The only thing which is in our control is input, which is basically practice. Yeah. So worrying about those things, I mean, it's it's like uh, like what MS Dhoni says, right? I mean, why should I worry about the weather? Because anyways, I cannot control it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. So it's like, it's the same thing. I mean, why should I worry about the returns outside of my practice? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Ram. Okay. Thank you.
so looking at the time, let me just take one question from the chat. And then I was originally planning for like a fun section with some anecdotes. So we'll probably spend about minutes on that, uh, if it's okay with you, Ram Prasad. Uh, but the question on chat I had was, uh, are professional Mridangam artists skeptical or hesitant uh, accompanying for the Bharatanatyam artists? Again, I mean, it's extremely personal question. Uh, so I don't think there is a universal answer to this. Uh, it's, it's like, it's the same as, you know, choosing a kapi or a kuchi, that's all. It depends on so many other factors. Obviously, a person who might not be economically well off, but has decided to take this as a profession, if let's say he or she feels that Bardhanadim is going to be more lucrative economically, then rationality will suggest that that person does that until he or she, uh, you know, earns a name or a teacher and he or she feels that, no, this is not what I want to do, or the other way around, whichever way it is. Or if a person is really wanting to accompany on Bardhanatyam, but it doesn't get enough opportunities, but use this as a stage to move there. There is nothing, it's nothing like one thing is superior over the other. But in a dance, basically, you go to a dance performance to, listen, to, to, to see the artist who's performing there, which is a dancer, and the artist, there are several other co-artists there violinist, the mardangist, the vocalist and other things. So the visibility for a mardangist in a bardhanatyam compared to uh, actual concert platform might be differential with respect to who you are. I think it's a personal choice. There's, there's no universal answer in my opinion. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you. Uh, let's switch to the fun section. So uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, mention, this is pretty much you know, sharing stories and interactions uh, we have, uh, we have uh, Norini Shivaram Mama, who is uh, in his 90s, uh, really big fan of uh, Sri Paniyayir. Unfortunately, he couldn't join today uh, because uh, he was telling me that he did want to join, but he's not uh, good in technology and he can't hear properly. But he's been sharing his anecdotes with uh, Sri Paniyayir on Facebook the last few days. Uh, he was saying that there is, uh, he recalled this uh, concert season in 1944 when he was like 14, 15 years old uh, studying in high school in Noorni. Uh, there's uh, uh, a concert series with uh, Sri Chembai Vaidinagat Bhagavadar, Palakat Ram Bhagavadar, uh, Sammangudi Srinivas Ayya, Ralatur Brothers and so on and so forth. Uh, all the concerts had uh, Sri Mani Ayya on the Mridangam uh, and then he recalled uh, uh, how he played several thalams and each were different uh, and innovative with no repetition. Um, and he just wanted to mention that he was uh, a percussionist par excellence. Uh, and then he even remembered this one episode, uh, I think he was mentioning during the Alatur Brothers concert where someone actually uh, was so uh, impressed that he ran to stage with an envelope with you know, apparently it had a lot of currency notes inside and also put like a rose garland on his, uh, on Sri Maniya's neck. Uh, and then the audience went gaga with a thunderous applause. Uh, yeah, he was uh, saying that uh, the magic of the Mridanga Chakravarti mesmerized everyone from age, uh, you know, 10 years old to like 90 years old or something. And he says, Mani Osai is Thani Osai, is what he had actually So just wanted to share that story with you. Um, I know, uh, Jayashankar, you had like a, a story you wanted to share as well. Do you want to? Yeah, actually, I think uh, Ram Prasad, I might have mentioned to you when we met uh, uh, last time. Uh, actually, uh, Mani Ayer, sir, has a house in our village. Uh, in fact, uh, my parents are from a place called Parainur, uh, very close to Palagar. He's and, from uh, Parainur, actually. He's from Parainur. People in Parainur, they refuse to accept that he's Palagar money. He's only Parainur money. <laughs> yeah, he's actually, and I was telling him what I was hoping to do, Ram, was, uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, my both mom and dad are from Parainur. They were adjacent houses and they are still there. In fact, my cousins are still there. So, you know, third generation. I was hoping uh, that I could get a photo of uh, Maniyar's house. In fact, I think I told you this. Your your house is right next to the Parainur Bhagavati temple. Uh, 
there is like Parinur Bhagavati is like uh, you know as popular as uh, the Guruvayur Temple, right? So I was hoping that uh, I could somehow get that. The house is there because I visited it. Uh, I think uh, about seven eight years ago just to get a feel for it. But uh, I asked my cousin to get a photo, but I have I didn't get. Uh, I haven't gotten the photo yet, but I was hoping once I get it, I'll, I'll send you a copy of it. But I'm sure uh, you would be elated to have a copy of that photo of uh, where your Tata lived. But it's, it's, it's a small world, right? So okay. just wanted to share that with you. Any other personal anecdotes, Roger and we know Shankar? No? If not, I can share one story too. So, uh, I don't know, Ram, if you know about this story. Maybe I've mentioned this earlier. Uh, so, my dad, uh, his name was uh, Ganapati, R. Ganapati. From, he was known as uh, USIS Ganapati. I don't know if you remember the story, Ram. But uh, he was one of uh, the music collectors in Madras. Uh, you know, there, at that time, you know, there were not a whole lot, like three or four people in Chennai who were like collectors of music. And my dad just used to listen to three people, right? MDR, Flute Mali, and uh, Palgat Mani here. And in fact, your dad was a close friend of his and uh, they used to share music. I remember I was young and you were young too. Uh, those days, uh, you know, they had a sizable music collection. And I remember coming to your house in West Marble or something and you've been to our house several times. Right. Right uh, after you finish, let me just share a very interesting story uh, that happened between, <laughs> that happened at Ashok Nagar where you lived. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I remember those weekend affairs. Uh, back in those days, you know, uh, you had to sit down and listen to the whole concert if you wanted it. So, and you had to carry this heavy spool tape players and I remember all the weekends where I accompanied my dad to your house in West Mamblam and you were here. Uh, I think I even remember uh, you singing in our house. My party was asked you to sing and uh, maybe it was like 1985 or 86 when you were like five, six years old. Uh, for you being like a very enthusiastic kid and you sang right away when they asked you to sing. So that was my remembrance. Yeah, so let me just share a very interesting thing. So as you rightly said, there were like few tape collectors. So obviously, Sri Ram's father, Mr. Ganapati was one. And it so happened that uh, for any kind of um, sadhana, if you want to go, you can go. Uh, for any kind of uh, confirmation on, uh, so typically the schools used to come and uh, people will have no clue of whether it was Raghumama or Shivaraman or whether it was Payani Ward, or whether it was Lal Budi, or whether it was Krishna Mama or Papa here. So Appa was one of the figures who used to sort this out. So whenever a new concert came into circulation and a new spool came in, uh, within the next two or three days, uh, somehow the information used to come through several people that this, there is a new concert. And invariably, the concert would be labeled incorrectly. It would have been GNSR, Lal Budi, and someone else. They would have said GNSR, somebody else, and somebody else. So Appa had to go there, wherever that was, and then uh, give the right, uh, you know, right reference and come back. So Ganapati Mama's house was like one given. It so happened that <laughs> this was 85 or 86. So we all know Tanjavur Ramdas, Andhapuri Ramdas, um, who was a Kala Acharya now, Manita Das disciple. So he used to almost stay in our house. So he was in West Mamalam at Kitamani Mama's house. But a lot of times he used to uh, stay at our house overnight. So there was one cousin of mine who was closer to my father's age and uh, we got an information uh, while my cousin, while that specific cousin and Ramdas Mama were home, we got an information through like a messenger saying that Ganapati Mama had received a spool and he, uh, he got an information that uh, the Murdangam was Manitata and uh, Kanjira was Pinewad. Typically when it comes as Manitata and Pinewad, typically it used to be Swami Nathapadai, which is Pinewad's uh, son. It, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Dakshamurthy Pudaya's son never used to be money, uh, Pioneer Ward. So my father was contemplating whether to go there, listen to it, because he was almost convinced, even before he got the information, that it's not going to be Pioneer Ward. Because he didn't get from other sources 
that a similar concept was in, <laughs> was in circulation. So what he did, he told, this is the instruction he gave uh, Tanjavar Ramdas and my cousin. He said, go to Ashok Pillar, take the second left or third left, and then make a right. You will get to a house <laughs> with a tree. He gave the description of the tree, and that will be the house of Ganapati Gode. They were like, give some address, give some mailing address, the number, the street. He said, no, you go there. <laughs> and Ramdas Mama, I have handled like very horrible and atrocious code wise, but this is the most complex of all. <laughs> Going to Ashok Nagar in a cosmopolitan city, shouting for one Mr. Ganapati. <laughs> and my father said, if somebody asks you who this Ganapati is, just say that he's a tape collector. People anywhere around that vicinity of one or two kilometers will guide you to the right place. And it so happened that they landed at the wrong place and they told that this is a person they wanted to meet. Mr. Ganapati, the tape collector, they guided them to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do remember coming to your house and singing Sanatana. I remember that song because that was a song that I sang as the first song for my first concert. Oh, so wonderful. I do remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, with that, I think we can, we are close to two hours. I can't believe we spent two hours together. Uh, I'd like uh, Sri Roger Natarajan to say a few words. Thank you, Sri Ram. Um, you know, for the past four months, um, half of the world, I would say most of the world is cooped up inside the house because of this COVID uh, virus. And there are firms working on vaccine and some firms working on therapeutic drugs. And then quite a lot of the normal human being, they are asking, okay, what do I do in the meantime? Well, um, you rely on divine things to keep your hopes high uh, until such time a therapeutic drug is found or a vaccine is found. And then, uh, one of the divine things, at least in for a certain segment of the population, is the Carnatic music. We, uh, it is divine as well as it is heavenly, and it is something that uh, we feel personal to. So, uh, Carnatic music um, comes very handy now to. Uh, sustain the daily living cooped up inside the house. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take. Hopefully they find the vaccine and drug pretty soon. But in the meantime, let us listen to uh, more Carnatic music and let us uh, listen to more people like Ram Prasad. Uh, you know, the thing that I liked about today was I have listened to thousands of concerts being part of Cleveland for the past 35 years, uh, but uh, this format and this kind of story sharing uh, is is uh, as much enjoyable, if not more, than a, a concert. Uh, so I, uh, it, it is it is fantastic. Uh, Sri Ram uh, decided on this format and had the wisdom to uh, organize an event like this. And 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 thanks to uh, Ram Prasad sir for sharing your personal stories. Not all the artists are willing to share their uh, Tata stories or Mama stories or Atta stories. And uh, you you were uh, willing to share that. Uh, we, we thank you very much for that. Um, since we are talking about your Tata, um, in Cleveland, Aradhana, we did celebrate his 100th centenary year uh, with special events. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Tiruchi Sankaran, sir, uh, he was comparing uh, the style of your Tata versus Pioneer Subramanian Pillai and so on. It was it was enjoyable. I was there. Uh, I may not have attended the exact event that um, we identified, but um, so uh, you know we have we have very uh, uh, memorable. Uh, events to, uh, to, to think about when we think of your Tata. Um, Sundaram sir was also telling that in the early 70s, uh, your Tata came to the US and then uh, there were 
there was going to be a concert in, I think it was in Pittsburgh, of a uh, violin trio of El Shankar, El Mani, El Subramaniam, and so on. And then, and then Ivartata was, was uh, the one who, who played. So I want, to, I want to share a couple. I know you were asking me whether we have any personal stories of, of uh, you, you know, Palakkad uh, Mani, Ayer Sir. I will tell you this. It's not a personal story, but you know, we have heard through others. Uh, your Tata is known for many things, but at least three important things. Uh, one is his integrity for the art. He will not compromise uh, a bit, you know, how uh, uh, a company should accompany the main artist. And you have, you have narrated a lot of stories uh, proving, proving his integrity. Uh, the second one was that after the concert, nowadays, if you see after the concert, they spend more time, you know, taking photographs and, and talking to audience and all that. Uh, and your Tata uh, was, was a very humble, simple person. He was not interested in all these fanfare. He would, he would quietly walk away after the concert is over, not have, uh, you know, uh, looking for all those, uh, accolades and all that. And then the third one, which is personal, and that is one of the reasons why he is a, considered a great guru, um, is that he was always very, very nice to his disciples, very nice to his students. He will not say a single negative thing under any circumstances. Uh, yeah, the, the normal joke is quite a, he will go to attend a concert of one of his disciples. And then the disciple, of course, will come and, uh, you know, do the namaskaram at the end. He says, how did I perform today? And your Tata's usual response is in Tamil, <laughs> So you can, you can take it. <laughs> he, he's known for that uh, phrase. So he, he is such a, such a fine uh, human being, uh, motivating all the disciples. And we, uh, we uh, no wonder that uh, after this many years, we still have fond memories of him. I, I remember, I mean, I'm 66 now, uh, in the early 60s and all that, we used to sit down and listen to a lot of concert. And, your Tata was the accompanist for many of the concerts of uh, MS and uh, GNB and so on. Um, I know we talked about uh, Cleveland. I remember, um, I believe you said you came in 2005. It's been a long time. So um, I, I, I have uh, Sundaram sir permission to say, well, it is long overdue to bring you back to Cleveland, so we will do so uh, as soon as it is uh, uh, feasible. Um, since I know uh, Sri Ram Ganapati very well, he's almost like my little brother. Um, you know, I don't know when was the last time uh, Ram Prasad sir, you have come and performed in Detroit. So, you know, it's about time that you come to Detroit as well. And, uh, and I, let me finish this with one uh, personal story with your family, not with you exactly. Uh, this was when uh, Nitya Sri came to the U.S. tour with uh, her mother, uh, Lalita Sivakumar, who is your Atai, and then uh, your Atimbeer uh, Sivakumar, sir. And I believe Yambar Kanan was a violinist. So after the, they stayed about almost a week with us. And one of their one of Silkumar's favorite game is carom board, and I used to be pretty decent at it. So this is how the carom board game went. Um, you were Attai and me, our partners, and Silkumar sir and uh, Embar Kannan, they are the other partners. And then we would play carom till two o'clock in the night. And then even though there is concert, upcoming concert the next day. <laughs> so. It, it is always memorable. Uh, so even though I have not personally met your Tata, uh, we have uh, fondest memories of him. And uh, so uh, th thank you for taking your time. And I, I, I tell you, 
Um, I hope uh, quite a lot of the, I see a lot of youngsters uh, who signed up for this. Uh, they listen to you very carefully. I ask the question for them, not, not for me. My kids are not learning Carnatic music. You know, my questions, you know, they are for them. And you gave excellent advice how not to be distracted by the, um, the glamorous side of the Carnatic music, but go towards the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, goal of learning the classism of the classical music. Uh, and then also what is the right format to uh, fine tune your uh, performance um, uh, day in and day out. So wonderful, it is, it is such a pleasure. Uh, I know I say this, as I've been part of Cleveland for a long time. Uh, one of the luxuries that I do not have is to sit down for one whole two hour or three hour concert. I have never listened to a whole concert. So this is one of the rare events where I was able to sit down for the entire one hour and 45 minutes, listen to everything without Sundaram sir telling me, go do this, go do that, uh, you know, for the, for the festival. So uh, it was a very, very enjoyable event. Um, so excellent, excellent Sri Ram. Uh, so thanks to all the audience for taking the time on a Saturday uh, morning. Uh, or whatever time it is in your local uh, time. So thank you very much. And uh, Sriram, so do you want to say anything? Yeah, thank you, Roger. So, uh, before uh, I say a few words, uh, do you have anything to, else to add? No, thanks, Sriram. Ram Prasad, thank you. Yeah, I, I'll just take a minute uh, to thank Black for having me here. I just hope what are I said are not merely entertainment things and they have stories from which they can learn from that's the most important thing like my father told me it's 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 entertainment is one thing that's the way we present but the core of it is like what we are able to learn from each and everything that jo not just money here it could be Ramanjigar it could be KVN it could be GNSR I mean all these stalwarts they have lived by example as to how we should be potentially living uh, and the kind of commitment that we should have so I think every story of past masters, we have something to learn from, not just one. We have like a million things to learn from. So I hope that through this interaction, uh, even if out of 100 people, if 50 people were able to grasp even one or two things, I think that's a great achievement through this, um, you know, through this technical fecundity that we have during these lockdowns. And thank you so much for the panelists because Jay Shankar, Vinod Sitaraman, we have shared the stage. And um, it's as much as a pleasure talking to you as it is to share the stage with you all. <laughs> so that's that's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for uh, you know asking such beautiful questions, Mr. Shankar sir, Mr. Roger, and also Sriram. And thank you, Roger sir, for conveying uh, the offer of uh, uh, Kiran Sundaram Mama. And uh, I I hope that I'm able to make this. I'm looking forward to making them whenever it is in Cleveland. And as for us, Glack. Thank you so much for all these people who are listening, despite the time constraints that you might have. Thank you so much.